الحمد للہ والصلاۃ والسلام علی رسول اللہ و علی علیہ و اصحاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شرع علی صدری و یسر علی عمری و اہل العبدت من لسانی یفکو خالی دس تھاک ول بی مور لائک اباؤٹ دا نالج مور دین یو پرابلی ایکسپیکٹنگ دس از اے بیان اور مے بی دس لائک اے خطبہ بٹ مور لائک دس از دا ایجوکیشن پروگرام ایکچولی because uh, if you go back into the history during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they mostly concentrate on the knowledge they all the sahabas went all over the world you can figure it out they went to spread the proper knowledge and later on um, all people were divided into different firqas labeling them and all that but i'm going to be like uh, going like gradually i'm going to be going to the another topics um <coughs> I'm going to be talking about the knowledge first. How important is our knowledge? How many kids do we have here? How many kids? Can you bring all the kids over here? Because I'm going to be talking to them also. Come in the front row. Come here, come in the front row. Okay, I'm going to be asking a question. If somebody don't ask me correct, I'm going to throw them out of the masjid, okay? And if you give me the good answer, I'm going to have a candy for you. Who likes purple? You like purple? All right, take it. There you go. This was in advance. If you don't give me the correct answer, I'm going to take it back, okay? Tell me something. What's your name? Arin. Speak loud. I don't hear, I don't hear. Can somebody can hear him? No. Arin. Okay, what do you do? You study? Yes. You don't study, right? That means you don't work. You work or you study? I study. You study. What do you study? Okay, what do, what do you know about Islam? Come over here, come here. Come this side, come this side. Don't throw this down, man. What's your name? Come here. My name's Arin. Arin? Arin. Speak here. What's your name? My name is Arin. Ali? Anybody can hear him? My name is Arin. Nobody can hear you, man. This mic isn't working. Oh, you got the wrong mic. All right. <laughs> My name is Arin. All right, good. What do you do? What do you study? Study for school. Study, mashallah. What do you know about Islam? Explain me something. Do you pray? Yes. <coughs> what do you pray? <coughs> Five times a day. Okay, how many surahs do you remember? Uh, I don't keep count. Okay, say some surah. Go ahead. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa tuha wa alayni idha saja Ma wa ta'aka rabbuka wa ma yakala Wa lal akhiratu khayru laka minal ula Wa la sawfa ya'tika rabbuka fatarda Alam yajidika yatima fa'awa Wa wajadaka da'ala fa'ada all right, you win. You can take some candy, whatever you like from here. Good, mashallah. Say, subhanallah. Now explain me the meaning of that. Do you know the meaning of that? Do you know the meaning of that? Do you don't know? Exactly, that was my point. You know, uh, I saw a video on the TV, on a YouTube actually, probably everybody knows the YouTube, right? So uh, they were showing the video, one of the parrot, he was saying, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and uh, the whole comments was saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. I was like, what? What's so Subhanallah about that? It's nothing. He's a parrot. He probably be hearing the tilawa every morning. So he just memorized that. He's repeating. So this is a problem we have in our kids today. They don't know what they're reciting. That's the main point. You know, when, when you recite the Quran, the Quran has to go here, not here. A child, you know how many children, millions of children memorize the Quran. Everybody agree with that? Millions of people, right? Even the elders and the kids. All of the kids memorize Quran. Thousands, thousands. When I make a kid like, come here, tell me something. 
You recite something. He says, okay, tell me what is it? Say, I don't know. What do you mean, I don't know? You have to know what is that. That's the first responsibility of our teachers to concentrate on this thing. Because our teachers, they just make the kids to memorize, just memorize, 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 memorize. What are you memorizing? You know, a lot of people, I say they're making a prayer. They're saying, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Aliki. What are you doing? You know, we are standing before Allah. We are standing before Allah. That's, you know, when we say like, Allahu Akbar, that means we are surrendering. We are just like forgiving everything for the sake of Allah. And now we are standing right before Allah. That means we leave the whole world behind and we are just like concentrating on our prayer and we are standing before our Lord to make our prayer. And when I say, they're saying, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Malik, Yawmiddin, Iyak, what is this? So that's like they just memorize and they keep repeating in their mind. The prayer has to go here. You know, when we recite, it says in Surah Fatiha, Iyya ka na'abudu wa iyya ka nasta'een. Oh my God, oh my Allah, I'm here to do prostration to you only. And you are the only one, source of helper, source of sustainer, and you are the one who's been sustaining me. And why do we have a problem? We have a problem of our Iman. Because we just memorize that. And that's the problem. If we have a knowledge, but if we do not utilize the knowledge in a particular way, or we don't have a taqwa, and we are not like operating the knowledge in the right way according to the Islam, that's useless. I read the book in a Sahih Bukhari, in the introduction, according to him on the Day of Judgment. It is just his opinion, it's not a fact. You say on the Day of Judgment, many people will come who have a knowledge and everything, and Allah will have the right, throw, throw his knowledge away. I say, you just have a knowledge, but you didn't use it. You don't know how to use it. You just memorize when you were a child. This is the problem we have. We just raised in our, in our parents, in our families. That's the way we are raised. We just memorize, and we keep repeating, keep repeating. But that's the problem we have it here, because we, we read the Quran here, but it doesn't go in our heart. If you go in our heart, then we will have a taqwa. You know, in the second chapter, it says in the first verse, and the second and the third verse, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alif Laam Meem, Zalik Al Kitabu La Raiba Fiye, Udallil Muttaqeen. This is the book of guidance, but for those people who have the Muttaqi, who are the Muttaqi people? Who has the taqwa? And what is taqwa? A shield. You have to have a shield over here. You have to know, you have to, you have to know what is wrong and what is wrong, what is right. You have to have a taqwa and you have to know how to fight with that. And you cannot fight with that until you have a connection with Allah. You cannot fight with that. You know, I remember there was in a, in a chapter 7, Surah Al-Araf from verse number 16 to 18, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected Iblis. What did Iblis told Allah? He said, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَا أَقْعُدَنْ لَلَمْ سَرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ ثُمَّ لَا أَتِيَنَّمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ عَيْدِهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ إِمَانِ وَعَنْ شِمَالِهِمْ وَلَا تَجَدُهُ أَكْسَرَمْ شَاكِرِينَ He said, I'm going to attack everyone from the right, from the left, from the front, and from the back. He said, I'm going to attack from everywhere. Now who could answer me that? How are you going to survive? Who's going to answer me that? Come on, kids. From you. Now there's a long explanation when he said, I'm going to attack from the right and from the left and from the front. So it has a long philosophy behind that actually. It's, not like, it's like one word it says in the Quran, but it has a very deep meaning. Like from, from the right side. That's from when you have a taqwa, it's going to attack you. From the left side, to put you into the scene. And from the front, that's like akhira. And from the back, he make you forget what happened to the people in your history. He make them forget everything to make you sin. So how are you going to survive with that if he's going to attack you from everywhere? Who's going to answer me that? Come here, come here. What's your name? Tamim. I'm not going to hold for you, man. Come on, Tamim. hold it. What? Tamim. Talk to people, talk to people over there. Uh, I'm training you right now, so when you be bigger, you're going to be here at my place, inshallah. So inshallah. All right. So shaitan is saying, I'm going to attack you from everywhere. 
explain me how you're going to survive. You can survive by... Um, Come on, speak loud. I didn't hear you. Can anybody hear me? Prostrating to Allah and um, reading the Quran and doing everything that... Can anyone can understand him? Yes. Commanded by... You say read it louder. Read it more louder. Um, I think you should prostrate to Allah, you should read the Quran, you should do everything that was commanded by him. And this way you can avoid them because whenever they see you do such that, they get scared because they can't handle the humiliation that they've, that they've had in like the beginning where they had, where they had to, where they had to prostrate to um, Alright, some of the answer was right, so I'll give you candy. Take it something from me, okay? Mashallah, good. Alright, the answer is Shaitan is attacking you from everywhere. But regardless how smart is he, he still forgot something. He forgot something. There was a scape hole that was up there and below and what does that mean when you say like above there and beneath how is that that's like having a strong connection with allah in your ibadah stop sinning but in order to stop sinning you have to get the knowledge in order to because let's say there's a many people who have been sinning a whole life without even realizing they are sinning until you get something later on, somebody comes to you and he will say, Oh, okay, you were doing this in, oh, astaghullah, I didn't even know that. Okay, good, they find something on a later age. And the word I say, the, the, the next cape hole, that is on the ground. You have to stay in a humble way. You have to stay humble to Allah. Because if you're humble to Allah, you're being sincere to Allah, keep yourself down into the place where God brings you from. That is from the dust. Allah said, stay in, a, stay in a dust. Do not try to bring an ego in you. Bring, don't try to do that because these things always are utilized and operated by shaitan. And it's the best weapon to make a fitna in the earth. And the next thing is, make your connection strong with Allah. And that's through the ibadah, with having the taqwa. And then rest, we still cannot rely on this thing. We still have to rely on the mercy of Allah. We have to still rely on that. We cannot do that. And okay. In chapter 2, verse number 31 and 32. When Allah created Adam, He asked all the angels to come before Adam. And Allah said to the angels, I'm going to create a human being. He said, Why you want to create a human being? They're going to create a bloodshed and they're going to create a fitna. And uh, they said, Say the things that I have taught Adam not to the angel. Now, who knows that uh, the human beings has more superiority over the angels. Even the angels are made from the nur. But do you know, a human being, we have the most priority over the angels because Allah gave them a free will. Allah didn't give them a free will because they have the restricted job. Like they have to do the rain, and they have to take care of the floodings, and they have to take care of the weather, and they have to do multiple jobs, right? And the Jibreel he has to deliver the message, and, uh, and there's a billions, billions of angels. We are not aware of them. We only know like the few angels that have been mentioned in the Holy Quran. And Allah said, وَأَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَا قُلَّهَا I have taught Adam the names that the angels didn't know about that. And so this way, we can see that our human being, we are better than angels. Because Allah gave them a restricted job, but Allah gave us a free will. But giving us a free will, He also have to judge us what way we took, what way we take. Like, do we take Allah's way or do we take a shaitan's way? Okay? So when shaitan said that I'm going to misguide human beings, the first thing he said that I'm going to stop people going to you. That was the first thing. And what is that? Worshipping. And that was that is what? That is a Tawheed. 
He said, I'm going to create a lot of misconception and I'm going to create a lot of confusion in the people's heart. They will think this is right. Like ever realize that why people are worshiping different things? Because according to them, they have a strong iman inside that this is the idol or whatever people worship. They have the faith on that, that this is the one who is a problem solving and they are the one who is sustaining us. And this is what shaitan is doing. And again, when somebody is worshiping like Christianity, they have so many divisions. And if you look at the, in Jewish religion, they have so many firqas. Similarly in Muslims, how many divisions do we have? So who's behind all this? Shaitan. Shaitan is causing this all problem. The Prophet ﷺ said, let me give you an ayah. It's from uh, chapter 6 from Surah Al-Inam and verse number 100. Let me give you like a verse number 103. Allah said, And this was the first ayah. Allah said, stick with the Quran and stick with the Prophet ﷺ. You're on the right path. And the second verse, it says in a, uh, Surah Al-Inam and the verse number 153. And this is a beautiful ayah. I like it. It's the best one. It says, "Awwadu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim." Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa anna haza sirat mustaqima. Fattabeu, wala tattabu subul. Fatafarra kubikum an sabili. And I have written like a small details in one of my books, actually very good details. And if you read like a Sahih Muslim and the Hadith number twenty-four, I know how many people you know Ibn Sari. Anybody heard the name of Ibn Sari? He was the best scholar. Who was the interpreter of the dreams? You know that. Ibn Isri, okay. He was the best scholar and during that time he was used to interpret the best dream because Allah gave him in knowledge. And his dream used to come like a very true. You can find his lot of sources online. He said when you are when you have a question about the deen, when you are learning about the deen, and if you want some opinion about the deen, so the person you're getting your knowledge, the person you're learning from the deen, and you're getting your opinion from somebody, first you have to understand the person you're asking from. Who, where did he get his education from? Where did he born from? Let's say, for, uh, let's say, as a Muslim, I'm going to a scholar to ask a question. Let's say I went, go, I went to the scholar, I ask a question about some, something, like I need a fatwa, I need some opinion. So I ask him, and uh, he will answer me according to his own education, where did he get his education from? Like for an example, let's say I'm going to give you like, I'm not going to name somebody, but uh, particular firqa, you know firqa, right? Everybody knows that. The sect of Islam, who's like a way, teachings are different, and everything is different. They are far, but still they call them a Muslim. But I, if I go and answer, answer something, ask them a question about something, they will answer me something different. But if I go to this person, he will answer different. Let's say we have a scholars here. I ask him the same question, he answered me different. He answered me different. He answered me different. He answered me different. Now how would you how would you judge that? How would you identify who is true? How would you judge that? You don't know until you come to sources and you learn the authenticity of the hadith. Because he has the education from school A, school B, school C, school D. Everyone has their own opinions. So how would you identify who is right? How would you identify that? That's the problem do we have in our ummah today. That's why we have a divisions today. And that's what a shaitan doing. Now let me come back to the words from the chapter 6 and 153. And the similar message was repeated in chapter 6 and Surah Al-Layna, number 159. Repeated the same thing. In 103, Allah said, do not make firqa. When you, when you say don't make firqa, right? That's like you label something here. Let's say you label yourself something. And after the Sahih Hadith, we have to follow the Sahaba. Okay, after the follow Sahaba, there was a problem came up later on. And uh, Allah sent us a great blessing in the name of four scholars. Everybody knows that, right? Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ibn Hanbal, Imam Shafi, and Imam Malik. May Allah bless them all. And uh, they give their opinion. Like, okay, this is my opinion. But not this generation. But the later generation, but the later generation, one of the person came was a shaitan in a human frame who came to misguide. I don't know if you know the stories of uh, during the time of Noah Islam, there was a pious people who passed away and the shaitan appeared in an old man. And he came to one of the person whose father was passed away or something like that. 
but he asked that he came and he said why don't you have some kind of uh, drawing or something so you can memorize your father being passed away so he said okay that's a good idea he kept something one and this generation gone now there's another generation came who whispered into their heart again he said why don't you just like make a big beautiful figure that's gonna look good so it will people will remember that okay so this generation is gone so now the next generation next generation came and they said why don't you just make a nice painting and why don't you just like uh, put some candles in there make a nice so they made a whole like a new statue they built up the whole statue and what happened the fourth or the fifth generation they start worshiping the idols that's how shaitan targets from the little thing but he doesn't target you but he is targeting four generations later putting them to lead to the shirk that's how shaitan targets that's what exactly going on here when allah said wa'atasimu bihablillahi jamiyum wa la tafarraqu and again in the surah al verse number 153 it says the same thing. Stay on the straight path. This is the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And that's beautiful interpretation. Like who, how many people drive? How many people drive? Anybody drive? You drive, right? Who else? Two people, right? Okay, so let's say you drive, right? When you're going on a highway, like let's say 495 or you can say Grand Central, anything, right? So let's say you're driving, driving on a highway you see a lot of exits, right? Exit one and exit two and exit three. Sometimes you get all the exits here and exit there. So there's a beautiful hadith on this verse, especially chapter six, one, uh, verse number 153. It's from Muslim and Ahmed and uh, it's by Jabir radiallahu And uh, Jabir radiallahu asked him, what is this, this verse means? So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained very well that we can imagine that. He was sitting on the ground. He was sitting on the ground and he was holding a stick in his hand and he draw a one straight line you understand he draw one straight line then he draw a few lines that was crossing each other so if I apply the same thing he said this is the Quran and this is the straight going to Jannah stay here go straight don't go here, don't go here, don't go here, just stay straight. Like focus on something on Jannah. And he say, on this, oh, these are highway and these are all exits going to the cities and towns and all that. And he said, on each exit, the shaitan is standing there. Now, what do you think? The shaitan will be there having a big thorns or it will be a human being? What do you think? The shaitan is not like a thorns, right? He will be in the face of human being. And he will be calling you, let me teach you something deen, it will go closer, it will make you closer to Allah. Everybody getting my answer? Pandas, you understand me? It will make you more closer to Allah. Now when, when you go back in the history, right? When Allah said to the Adam, Allah Islam, He said, do not go to this tree. That, that's the first commandment of Allah. That was the first commandment. He said, do not go to this tree, that's it. What happened? He said, no, no, no. Allah says, I don't want to go to this street. Now try to understand the logic. Allah said, do not go there. This is the first commandment. And in the middle, shaitan appeared. Now he wants to misguide him. He said, do not go to that tree. Now shaitan said, he whispered in his heart. You know why Allah is not telling you? He's telling you not to eat it because you're going to be very close to Allah. He said, the reason Allah doesn't want you to eat this fruit because you don't want to be with Allah? He said, yes, of course, I want to be with Allah. So this is something misguided. This is the root cause of a bid'ah. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Okay, this is the root cause of a bid'ah. This is the root cause of a bid'ah. When Allah said, hold this Quran, hold this Quran, and we have a not a thousand, but a multi thousand of ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ to stick with this. this. This is our religion, Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And if somebody calls you and somebody is coming to you to teach you something about the thing, let's see if I have a book, something in my hand. Okay, okay, let's everybody get together. We're going to do some education here. 
don't do that because it doesn't exist anywhere. It doesn't exist. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, concentrate on your life. Because you don't want to go here and there. Because you have, to, in order to find something right, anything you do in the matters of deen, you have to understand and you have to verify and you have to research if this was based on Sahih Hadith. If you see if this, this does not based on a Sahih Hadith, so you get your answer. This is not something the Prophet ﷺ teaches. You got my point? Like anybody comes to you, let's do some, let's do some education. Let's do something in the sake of Allah. First of all, let's see what, what is he teaching about? What is he teaching about? Is it something from the Sahih Hadith? Is this a teaching from the Prophet ﷺ? Is this a teaching from the Sahaba? No. So why are you doing this? Who are you following? That's the question. Who are you following? That's the problem we have right now. That's why we have a division. Because in past in 1800, there was a many scholars appear in India and Pakistan who being started like a very, very new things. Very new things. That's nothing from the Sahih Hadith. That is nothing that was taught by the Prophet that was not taught by the Sahaba. How much time do you have? 640, right? Okay. <coughs> now everybody knows there's a three types of sin that which is like unforgivable. The one is shirk. The second one is kufr. The third one is bid'ah. We can identify the shirk, but not yet, because the shirk starts from the minor and goes to the major. We say kalima, right? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It has a two meanings. The first meaning is what? When we say la ilaha illallah, that means we believe there is only one creator. We believe there is only one creator who created us, and our job is to worship him. If you read in Surah Zariyat and uh, verse number 56, Allah said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِعَبُدُونَ I have created ins and the jinn just to worship me. And when you say worship me, right? That's a very complicated word. How many, uh, who would you answer me? What do you say about the worship? What does worship mean? What are you going to answer me that? Kids. Come on, man, slap you on the back, man. You going to answer? Who's going to answer me? What's the meaning of the worship? Worship means what? Worshipping cartoons? Worshipping Tom and Jerry? What else? Right, eh? Worshipping games all the time? What else? Okay, the worship means has a broad meaning. Majority, or maybe I would say some people does not understand that. The worship has a broad meaning. Many people, or some people I would say, they think praying five times, or doing salah, and doing fastings, and doing a hajj and the zakat, it's a worshiping. But that's part of the worshiping. But many people does not know the worshiping means living a life according to the Creator in 24 hours. That's what a worshiping means. Each, every moment, we are worshiping Allah. Either we are disobeying Him, Oh, I, either we are obeying him. That's a worship means. That's what it says in the Sifat Surah. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nastain. Oh God, I am going to be worshipping you. And you are the only one who is helper to me. That's a worship means. And uh, what is a kufr? Who would say, the, what is the definition of kufr? Who would answer that? Who would answer me the word kufr means? Kufr means any type of a dis a disappointment from Allah. Astaghfirullah. There's a beautiful ayah in the uh, Holy Quran in uh, chapter 39 of verse number 53. It's a beautiful ayah. It's like a best ayah that's encouraged to the person who, is the, who, who thinks for himself, I'm the very bad sinner and Allah doesn't listen to me. <clears throat> it says that, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah And Allah said, to the Prophet ﷺ to deliver my message to you all the people. He said, "Kul ya ibadi Allah zina asrafu ala anfusihim la taknatu min rahmatillah. Inna hu inna inna Allah yaghfiru zanuba jamia. Allah ghufrain." Allah said, "Give my message to those people who consider themselves as the worst sinner, 
worst sinner like let's say you are you are involved in alcohol you are involved in riba or you are involved in any type of sin do you think your sin can reach the sky anybody can think that do you think your sin you are enough like a bigger sinner that your sins have reached the sky no we can read that we can't even cross this room right so who who puts like a disappointment in our heart that's a shaitan and that's the best aya for the people who are being disappointed from their life and they say you know i always say i'm uh, forgive me allah then i go back to the sin forgive me allah go back to the sin forgive me allah go back to the sin so this is the aya allah is saying that until you die until you die you keep asking forgiveness and i will keep forgiving you even you the bigger sinner you drink alcohol you curse you do any type of sins you say one time your one drop comes out of your eye drops on the floor before that i like to forgive your sins even you the bigger sinner you drink alcohol there's a lot of people who been drinking alcohol whole their life and i like give them a hidayah just before they die many cases came to me who said tawba after 6 months they die because allah likes them and allah give them a hidayah you know say in surah al-araf verse number 178 may yahdi allah fal mutadil wa may yudlil fa ulaika hum al-khasirun allah is the one who chooses people who wants a hidayah but allah doesn't give a hidayah until you want it if you ask allah allah please show me the right path allah will show you but if you don't want you to show sure, show the right path allah say okay go do whatever you like to do it says in chapter 7 of surah al-araf verse number 186 He say, "May you do not love, but Allah the Allah, we are the wrong fit to give a name Yaman." This is a beautiful ayah. It, it, it's like a, it's like a mother carrying a child, and the child is keep hitting a mother, put me down, put me down, put me down. I want to do whatever I like. The mother knows that if she leaves him alone on in the people, he's gonna get lost. So finally, the mother said, "Okay, go to hell. Go, go away." do what i want to do now now when he check when he looks around the mother is not there now he is screaming now he is screaming oh mother please help me where are you where are you where are you i didn't know that so this is what allah is saying if you want to the hidayah allah will give you hidayah if you want don't with the hidayah allah said okay do what you what you like to do you are free you are free do what i want you like to do but who gets a hidayah when you ask allah oh allah please show me the right path please i am the sinner i cannot control myself you are the one who is going to show me the hidayah And the next thing is bidah. That's the most worst disease. That's the most, that's the most, most worst disease I would say. Now, why do I call this worst disease? Bidah is not a sin. Now, try to understand. Bidah is not something drinking alcohol. Bidah is not something you commit adultery. Bidah is not something you take some innocent money. Bidah is something. which shaitan let a muslim do in the name of allah in the name of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and trust me a common muslims are entire their life being involved in bidah and they don't even recognize the bidah like for an example i have a lot of questions that i get from email like hundreds and thousands so i'm going to share with you so you get a knowledge that people have a confusions all the time what is bidah bidah is something you want to do something more let's say prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to do a zikr like 33 times i'm sure everybody know that right you do a 33 times that be like alhamdulillah allahu akbar and subhanallah right shaitan comes to you now how does he appear? now how does he attack you there's a two ways he can attack you one your whisper the second way in the form of human being it could be me if i'm teaching you something which is not from the sahih hadith don't trust me if something contradicting quran and sahih hadith do not follow me if i'm teaching you something i have a book and it says something different do not follow me if i'm teaching you i have a quran in my head just do what it says now if i say okay you know what you're sitting down do a 100 tasbih and you're going to be cured and you're going to be like if you don't have the knowledge you'll start doing it you say no 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 this has a some special barakah in there this has a special barakah who said that the prophet said that 
Did the Prophet said that to do 100 times? No. What did the Prophet said? Do it 33 times. So what is the use of doing 100 times? That means you have stopped following the Prophet Now you are following somebody else's teachings. I get so many questions that people say they get a lot of wazifas. How many people are familiar with the wazifas? Wazifa. Wazifa is something like you do something for a certain time and uh, for so many times, for so many days, and you're going to be cured. That's what a wazifa means. You never heard of that? Yeah, I heard. You heard, right? You know wazifa, right? Like many Malanas in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they say, okay, take this and paper. You take this and you're going to be cured, inshallah. Who said that? The Prophet said that? Sometimes, yeah. Okay. What is the reason you're following him? What is the reason you want to do that? Let me ask you a question. What is the reason you want to do something like that? You know, the reason is weak Iman. What if you have the same Iman on the Quran? If you have the same Iman on the Quran, right? You're going to be cured. If you have the same Iman on Allah, you're going to be cured. But you are so much weak that third person told you to take this, read this for so many days, and you're going to be cured. That's bid'ah. So that means we don't have to do anything that is contradicting Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Because our Akida, let's say, if you have four scholars, right? Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless them all. So later generation, did any of the scholars say to label yourself Hanfi? Did anybody in scholar told you to be Shafi? No, right? None of them said that. So right now, we have a problem here. Because that, that's a problem here. I'm sure I might be saying like a few things which might be contradicting many of you. I'm sure. But you can verify inshallah. Because what I'm saying is totally from the Quran and Sayyid is because I don't follow anyone. I do not obey anyone. For me, may Allah bless them all. It, they are all opinions. For an example, let me give an example. I just gave this example last week on Friday in other masjid. Somebody come to me. He said, I want to uh, drink a water. Your brother was there, right? Okay, and uh, let's say someone comes to me, he says, can I drink a water in a cup? I would say yes. You can do that, it's permissible. Okay, one of the brother came, he said, is it allowed to drink a water in a bottle? I said, okay, yes, it's permissible. And some of the brother came to me, he said, can I drink a water in a jug? I said, yes, that's permissible. And somebody come to me and he said, can I drink a water in a bowl? I would say, yes, that's permissible, right? As long as it's not haram, it's not contradicting Quran, it's not contradicting Sahih Hadith, right? It's permissible, you can drink that, that's fine. Even you can drink in your own hands, right? So what happened, these were the different opinions from these scholars. One of them said to drink a water in bottle. One of the scholars said drink, I'm just giving an example. Not that they said that, but I'm just giving an example how later people divided. Because this is the topic of the talk today, how people divided. But what if you just remove the label from your forehead? Stop calling yourself, I'm this, I'm this. Let's say this brother is Hanfi, this brother is Shafi, this brother is Humbly, this brother is Maliki. So we have four people, right? But what if you say you are none of those? What if you just remove the label? You're going to be back together. Am I right? This is the problem Shaitan is causing between us. This is the shaitan is causing a problem between us because he's saying, oh, he's this, oh, he's that, oh, he's praying like that, oh, he's not doing it then, oh, he's doing it then. Forget about these things. Invite people to make salah. Don't put them into the contradictions and the interruption and confusing somebody's mind. Let's say somebody's not praying. And two scholars come there. No, you have to pray like this. One of the scholars said, no, you have to pray like that. And this person will be like, what is this? Are they inviting me to pray? And they start fighting to pray like this. Forget, forget about that. Ask him to go start praying. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, Allah will give you more hidayah. Ask him to start praying. This is a contradiction. Make the people run away from this thing. We have to bring people close to Islam. Not to talk about something which causes contradictions. Not talk about something which making a people run away. We have to talk about people come to Allah but on the authentic knowledge. And the authentic knowledge is what? What is our, what is our first priority? It's towards the Quran. Okay, Th that's our book. We have to call people to the book, nothing else. If I say, okay, this book says, okay, uh, Malana Sayyid, or this is, says uh, Mufti Sayyid, or this is Sayyid, uh, forget about it, throw in the garbage, I don't need that. 
call people to the Quran. Because you know what happens? If you call people to other books, right? Okay, do some education at home, do this and that. What happens? People stick to that and they forget about the Quran. They forget about the Quran and they stick to that. That's what is going on. They don't want it going on, going on. And it keeps spreading to more people, more people, more people. It is keep spreading to the more people. Tell them to go inside Quran. The Prophet and the Sahaba, they concentrate on the education. We have to have an education. Let's say for an example, what is bid'ah? You are carrying a basket, you are carrying a, like a uh, bucket of water. You know, bucket, right? You're carrying that and you are going to your home. When you reach your home, there is no water in there. You say, what is this? I fill up the bucket and my, there is no water. How is that? Because you never checked that there was a hole in the bucket. You know what I'm talking about? There's a hole in the bucket and you don't know that. Your entire, your good deeds, your ibadah is leaking. And how do you want to save that? You have to first to verify that that is from the Prophet ﷺ. Is this the teaching was from the Prophet ﷺ or is the teaching from somebody else? I hope you're getting my point what I'm talking about. Right? Many Muslims are involved in this disease. Nobody knows that. This is what I'm doing. On every masjid I'm going and telling these people to remove the labels. Stop calling yourself this and that. If this Muslim is raising his head, okay, fine, alhamdulillah, that's fine. As long as he's praying, right? He's praying to Allah. One of the brothers is not doing this. That's, let him do it, let him do it, let him pray. Leave him alone. That makes him like create a hate and he's gonna run away from, the, from Islam. We have to bring people to Islam, but based on the authentic teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, what was the problem with uh, the Christianity? They had the same problem. They were just blindly doing whatever is being taught by the priest. And that's the same. You know this hadith where it says the Prophet ﷺ says 73 firqas in the Muslims will go to Jahannam and the one firqa will survive. Now how are you going to identify you are one of the survivors? Can anyone identify that? No. No one identified that. But the Prophet ﷺ said the one who is holding the Quran the only one who's going to survive who is holding the Quran and he is following the Sahih teachings. Now get my point. Try to get my point. If you want to build up a taqwa at your home, if you want to build up an education system at your home, follow the Quran. Have the authentic materials at home. Because what you're doing today, your children are going to be doing, doing the same thing. You understand my point or something? You get my? If you don't understand, please feel free to ask me. Something like that. I gave that like a small notepad. If somebody has a question, they can ask a question. That's fine. If someone has a question, brother, please feel free to ask me a question about the shirk, kufr, or bidah. Like uh, you have a particular this problem and you are confused about something and I couldn't understand. Maybe I will clarify that. Is that a right or is that a wrong? Actually, it's very tough to uh, understand which which one is bidah because we are not all. Come here. Uh, Come here. I'm saying uh, we are not alim. If somebody say you follow this, you do this, uh, he, like uh, he may be like you. It looks like a alim. Come here, come here. We have uh, beard, we have cap. Right, come here, come here, come here. Talk here. Uh, say your name. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Shahabuddin. Uh, actually, uh, you you are saying about the. Uh, uh, major thing, last thing is the Bida. Uh, but uh, I am saying, how I understand this is Bida? You saying, uh, you follow this, you do uh, 33 times Subhanallah. Some other Alim saying no, you say 100 times Subhanallah. You say, uh, this is not in Soya Hadith. He say, it is in this in the Hadith. Uh, which one I follow? How I understand it is the Sohi Hadith. But I, I, I never uh, read the Hadith. I don't know Siya Sita. I don't know Joy Hadis. How I understand this is Bida? That is the problem. Right, that's a good question. Zakallah khair, brother. Hello. Okay, this, this is what exactly I was talking about. Like a common Muslim, 
they do not, uh, they, they, there's no way they can identify that. But this is the problem that we have. Let's say I have a brother here, and you have four scholars here. You go to him, he says different. You go to him, he says different. He, he goes to him, these four scholars give the different opinions. One say, okay, do this 33 times. One of the scholars said, okay, do it 100 times. One of the scholars say, no, you do like 1,000 times, and inshallah, you're going to be very close to Allah, and your problem is going to be solved. Good. One question that's going to solve your problem. You have to ask a scholar, you have to ask a scholar, is this something was taught by the Prophet Sallallahu show me the Sahih Hadith? That's your question. If he would not be able to do it, you got your answer. You will find a lot of people in our countries, in our countries. If you go to Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, so many peers, so many buzurgs, so many people, listen, I'm sure I'm going to contradict you, but, but I'm not going to say anything which is Quran and Sahih Hadith. I don't say I follow this buzurg and follow that buzurg because we are not supposed to be following anyone. We are not supposed to be getting anybody's opinion. You have your own way to judge that. Then I'm going to give you like a little bit of background about my education. When I started my education like 12 years before, and I'm going to, not going to be naming like a particular groups and particular groups and all that, but uh, I get one sect, they have a different system of education. Different books, different compilations, different. I was, okay, Alhamdulillah, because I didn't know that. Then I went to the another scholar. He was uh, not from the same sect, but he was a different sect. I was like, okay, and Alhamdulillah, everybody, he's a very well-renowned scholar. Let me go to him. His education is perfect, mashallah. Everybody knows him. So this is the problem we have. When we see some, somebody big, they think, okay, he knows everything. That's a problem we have right now. When you go to our countries, there's a big Maulana being very well-renowned in the public. Every person knows him. Do not follow him. You need to identify what he's saying. Because you will just accept everything. But as you say, it's based on your trust. But even I tell my students, please do not follow me. What I'm telling you, write it down. Go check. And then you come to me. If somebody contradicts, I'm going to clarify you. I'm going to find you hadith where it says that. Because Alhamdulillah, I've been researched all hadith, like several, several times, thousands of hadith. That's the problem I have because the common Muslim, they do not research. And it's really confusing. That's why people like common Muslim, they get misguided from all these things. But what happens if you do these things on the Day of Judgment? You know, there's a hadith on the Prophet Sallallahu on the Day of Judgment. Uh, you know how they call right? The river of Kothar? Yes, river of Anyone? Kothar. Whether I, where it says like in Nathaina Kal Kautha for the Lily Rabbika, right? Okay, on the day of judgment, the Prophet said, All my Ummah will be drinking of water from the river of Kauthar, and I will be there and I will be giving them a water with my hand. But some of the angels from Allah, they will come and push them away. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he's going to ask why the angels are pushing my ummah away. These are my ummah. And uh, Allah will say, this was your ummah. But they created something new. They were not on the base on the authentic teachings where you left back. Later on, they developed something new. They created their new teachings and everything new, new, new coming up because the problem is you're following your scholars. You're following your scholars. You're following scholars. Back in 1800, there were some scholars appeared in like, India, in Pakistan. There was a new program, a new system started. But I asked them one question. Is it something what the Prophet ﷺ taught us? They say no. I say, why are you doing? They say it's opinion. It's, uh, it's your opinion. You want to do it, do it. If you don't do it, do it. But, but, yeah, but I told them, but you are doing this, right? He said, yes, you've been taking this book. You've been going around. Please don't take me wrong. I'm sure I'm going to contradict many of you. You might be won't like what I'm saying. I'm sure. I'm sure you won't like it. But inshallah, I'm not saying anything. 
and I am stick with the pure person with the Quran and Sahih Hadith. I get a lot of emails from all over the world, not in hundreds, thousands of emails. They get something, information from their local scholar. They send me the information, they said, verify that. Now why these people sitting in all over the world sending information to me in the email to verify something, they get the fatwa from their local imam, is based on trust. Because based on appearance, you can identify who this person belongs to. You got my point? So what our duty, especially the, I'm talking about the youngsters, youngsters, you understand what I'm saying? In your life, when you learn something about the deen, you have to research yourself, not just getting an opinion from one scholar, not from the two scholars, not from three scholars. You need to either research yourself or get an opinion from different scholars in order to learn the pure Islam. You know, Islam is becoming like more, we have a pure water here. Now other things are materials being, ingredients are getting into the water, it's getting dirty, 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 dirty. So what me and our teams and like uh, maybe many of like international scholars that I, I also work with the Peace TV and their scholars and we have been like coordinated to each other, all of them. So we, everybody knows each other because we are on the same Akidah, like Quran and Sahih And this is the only way you're gonna survive because that's what the, the Quran in chapter six, verse number 153 said. You have to stick to the straight path. So what I was saying that when you're driving on the highway, right, you see a lot of exits coming to the cities and towns and uh, like, let's say the shaitan comes to each exit in the human form. And he said that, okay, this is the teachings I have. Let's Come with me, join me, join me, and we're going to do something for the sake of Allah. Inshallah, we will have a taqwa, we will have this and that. You don't need to do that. Because that's a problem we have. We do not identify the people. On each exit, stay in your life, concentrate on your life. That's what Allah says. And <coughs> then rely on the mercy of Allah. <coughs> Anybody has a question? If you don't know, understand something. Do you get my answer? Yeah, yeah. Do you get my answer, right? Any more questions? Brother, do not hesitate. Because in Islam, the Prophet said, do not hesitate. Do not be shy when it comes to the Islam. Because you might be doing something unknowingly, you are like earning not a reward, but you are earning a sin. But on the day of judgment, your bucket will be full of sins, not will full of good deeds. So that's like we have to understand on each time what we do, the way we do. We have to understand everything. We are doing the right way according to the Prophet ﷺ. The question that I have received uh, usually from online, I'm going to share with you, okay? So you can benefit out that. Okay, how many names of Allah has? I'm going to ask the kids to answer me that. How many names? 99. 99? Who else? Come on, you don't know how many names of Allah has? How many names? 99? 99? You're 99. Who else? Come on, elders. 99. 99? Okay, who else? Allah has thousands of names, but out of all those, this is the one. You come here. Me? Yes. Answer me here. Allah have very unlimited names, we don't know. But out of all those, 99 names are very prominent. Good, mashallah. Take a candy, that's where you reward. That's correct. Allah has many names, but only by mention by 90 names in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Did you take my candies? Give me back that, because you lied and you said wrong, wrong answer. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the date of birth of the Prophet ﷺ? Who's gonna answer that? The kids. Kids, come on. There's only like one who's, who's keep answering me that. What is the date of birth of the Prophet ﷺ? You know why we have a problem with that? 
because the problem that we have, the biggest problem, we are not raising our kids properly. I'm telling you very honestly. And I'm telling a lot of Muslim families, and this is what my biggest project is, to build an Islamic school in this area. We have hundreds of kids go to the public schools and they're getting a poison in their minds. You think they are affected? No, they are not affected. The next generation and the next generation is going to be affected. Definitely it's going to happen. What do you think they're learning there? Everything, right? They're learning everything. But what if we get together and build one big school, high school, and remove all the kids from the public school, you know how many kids we're going to have? Maybe more than 500, more than 1,000. How many, how many Muslims do we have in this area? Think. More than 50,000? Think about the kids. This is our generation. And the parents are relying them for them. They're going to answer them. Leave me on the day of judgment. Because Allah will ask them what you teach them. And they will say, okay, my parents put me in the public school. You know, I know that Islamic schools are not perfect. But at least they are in the safe environment. They are in safe environment. When your boy goes to school, when our girls goes to school, what do you think? They are safe? They are not safe. This is what my biggest dream project is, to build a big high school in this area that's gonna cost me a one million dollar or something to buy a building. That's my main project I'm going to be doing. Because maybe many parents, I'm sorry to say that, apologize, forgive me my words. All, there are so many madrasas. So many madrasas there. But what if all the madrasas get together and build one school and save our generation going to the public school and put them in a good environment? They can do that. But everybody's concentrating in their own project. Everybody's concentrating on their projects. And this is what I'm planning to do. And they don't even know the simple basic things. Because the parents, maybe they go to a job, they do something. They don't even know what they're learning. They just send them to madrasa, he's learning Quran, come back. And if you ask him, what did you learn? He will just repeat what he said. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Who's going to answer me that? Date of birth of the Prophet ﷺ. 570 July. What date? Come here. <coughs> Say your name, brother. Come My here. name is Farhad Chaudhry. 570 AD. Uh, Date of birth? 12 uh, Rabil Awar. Okay. Uh, 570. Okay. Take a seat. Jazakallah khair, brother. Who else? What do you say? I do say 570, 12 Rabil Awar. Who else? Yeah, five. Different opinions? Monday. Yes. You? Yes, Monday. No, you know. Alhamdulillah, he's staying with me, learning something. <laughs> what about you, brother? 12? Yeah. How many say 12? Raise your hands. Yeah. Let me catch this guy. Imam Shab, come here. My question to you is, what is the date of birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Say your name. Who said that? What is the question? Date of birth of the The Rasulullah question Rasulullah. is, the, what is the date of birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This one not undisputable, but this one said Rabi ul Awwal. 12 Rabi ul Awwal. But there is so many different, different opinion here. But about the death day, this one performed. Uh, what is the uh, uh, Authentic. Because when Rasulullah Sallallahu has born, that time it wasn't clear he will be perfect. That's why people not keep his date of birth. Now also is not important date of birth in Islam. Because this one not date of birth, this one delivery day. That's why this one delivery. Do you understand what I'm saying? This one not birthday. What is the question by Aish? I try to understand your perception. Why are you asking? Just the date. One? Just the date. Okay. Just for their knowledge so they can understand. Just okay. I'm talking to the kids. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, you win. Take some candy from here. Take. Oh, for me? Yeah. <laughs> you win. 
So he answered, there's a different opinion. So when somebody, what do you mean by he was born in the year of Elephant? I'm not going to answer you, I'm not going to answer Imam Saab. Who's going to answer? He was born in the year of Elephant. What does that mean? You're not going to answer that because you probably know that. You come here. Yes. Say your name and answer. My name is Omer Ahmed. Okay. I believe the answer is uh, Prophet Muhammad was born in the year of the elephant. Is when what does that mean? It is when the elephants attacked the Kaaba and the, uh, the, I forgot the, the, birds. the birds threw the stones and each one of the uh, stones had the name of the person who died. Yes, I'm going to continue with that. Okay, that's the answer. If you know the Surah, surah Al-Fil, right? Yeah, you can take it. Many of you know Surah Al-Fil. I say, I was with the Imanish Shahid on a gym, it's Allah Rahman Rahim. In the surah, they're talking about Ashab al Field. Why was this being called Ashab al Field? Because they were the people of elephant. Like, how many people know the King Abraha? Anybody knows the King Abraha? So, anyway, there was a King Abraha who brought his whole enemy with the elephants. And all the Meccan, they prayed to Allah to guard the Kaaba. And it was the, uh, really history that Allah himself guarded his own house. And he sent the birds who stoned all the army and they were burned and they were like vanished. And what is the second sign according to the Sahih Hadith? The second sign is he was born on Monday. So we have two signs. But you must everybody note down something. There is not a particular date according to any Sahih Hadith. Because this was just an opinion by many scholars. Got that? I'm telling you this knowledge so you can remember that. The next question. <clears throat> can I celebrate Milad? Now, I, I don't know. This question, it might contradict some of you. But this is something which related to the birth, birth of the Prophet Like many, many people know Milad, right? I'm sure everybody know Milad, right? And uh, I don't know if this is going to contradict many of you, if my answer is going to contradict. This celebrate Milad, but, he, but here's a question. Many people celebrate, but in different forms. Some of the people just dancing, like if you look in the back in the countries on YouTube, you will find a lot of sources being being celebrating different ways, singing, dancing, and in Pakistan this is the worst place because they have the biggest this problem in Pakistan and nobody is there to stop them and it's getting more worse because in every uh, almost like in every Juma khutbah Rasul sallallahu he used to recite Sharul Mura Mada Satuha fa inna kulla bidatin dalal wa kullu dalal finnat and if we just understand from this from this sermon, right, of the Prophet And if we apply that in today's date, he was definitely 100% right. It was started something from a tiny, and this disease being spreading more and more and more. People are going towards fahash, even a pornography, into the adultery, doing the different things in the name of celebration. What time is that? Huh? What time? So oh, we have a time, right? Okay. Now the another form of celebrating Milad is Nasheeds. Now I'm sure many will contradict me. But this is something which taking away people from the Quran. Because I have seen my with my own eyes that people who are being addicted to the Nasheeds, right? they forget about the Qur'an. They listen to Qur'an once in a month, one week, but they listen to Nasheed every single day. It starts from little, but going further to, towards more Dalala. What's another form? No, the Imam said we still have a time. This is exactly what Imam Sab said. We started something from little, 
But what happens when, when you are stuck with adhere to something, something right? Then your mind is being stuck there, and the shaitan takes you so far away, and you even forgot. Oh, I forgot something to do. What was the more first priority for me to do the first thing? What was it? The Quran is the first thing, or what is the first priority? And I was supposed to be doing that. We leave many things for other things, which is not even useful. Uh, let me go to the next question. Anybody has a question about that? Yeah. What is it? Come here. That's okay, man. Come here. What's your question? Speak up. Yeah. Speak up. Is seafood makhru? What is it? Is seafood makhru? Yeah, give me that. Seafood is the only food which is totally haram. As long as you are not getting which is already died. Do you understand? Which is not already died. All the seafoods are halal. You can eat that. I mean, like, it's up to you. You want to start eating octopus? That's fine. I mean, that's fine. If there's a limit. You can eat lobster or whatever you like. But there's you no know, something you have to read a shahada. You have to say Allah. But you don't have to do the on that. Because Allah give them a zahibah. Because that's a seafood already. So we don't have to do that. But other things, there's many things you have to understand. There's a halal or haram. But for the particular, for the seafood, it is totally halal. Alhamdulillah. Anybody else? Okay, what is jihad? Who's going to answer me that? The youngsters. What is the meaning of jihad? Answer. Fighting for Allah. Speak loud, I don't hear. Struggling for the sake of Allah. Going through pain for Allah's sake. Who else? No, not you. Who else? Listen, jihad is a very simple word that if you can look around in the media, especially the youngsters, they probably go to school, they probably hear like a lot of bullying on you. Who got bullied? Like anybody bothered you anything about that? But anyway, like in many said the kids were like being bothered and they're being bullied about calling them a jihadi and this and that. But uh, especially the youngsters, you have to understand that what jihad is the simple means try to work hard what is the jihad for an imam his jihad is to make sure the community is safe and he's being taking care of that he's doing salas he's being informing the community with their matters and events and everything okay what is the jihad for a student who's going to answer that what is the jihad for a, for a student Studying. You said studying, right? Right, exactly. Jihad changes according to the situation and the status. Let's say, what is a jihad for a wife? Her jihad for a woman is to take care of a husband. So it is based on the situation. So if you look around, the media is being using this name and disgracing in Islam. So I'm telling you this one, so you have to answer them back. What does this simply means? Because the, jihad, the word jihad came out from the root word, which is jahada, which is simply means sir, like strive in something. Like if you want to, let's say for a father, jihad for a father is to work hard and provide for his family. You got it? For a father, it's a jihad for him to provide for his family, for his children and for his wife and for his, uh, for his uh, parents. <clears throat> So I'm telling this all the students because you probably get like a teenager or something because you're going to hear a lot of things from the media and a lot of people they are being aggressive. They even come to me with the aggression and we have to be very patient and we have to answer them back very properly. Because it says in our chapter 16 verse number 125, when somebody comes to you with aggressive, we have to answer them and answer them back with the wisdom, with the hikmat and uh, we have to be patient. Whatever they say, we have to take it. We have to be patient. Okay, uh, playing lotto and selling lotto. Who's going to answer that? You know lotto, right? Lotto, I'm talking about the one you go to the convenience store and you buy the lotto, you rub up the and you win. Okay, I win like $1 million. I'm talking about that. What do you, what do you think about that? I think betting money is 
betting money is haram because you can lose and it hurts you? <clears throat> okay. Laro selling and buying are both haram because we get this reference from the Prophet ﷺ. He said uh, on the basis of an alcohol, he said the one who sells it, the one who hands it, the one who buys it, and the one who carries it, and the one who is delivering it, all of them are being involved in the same category. If you're doing something wrong, right? Like, like, let's say if somebody is doing wrong, and you are helping, okay, he's been working very hard. Let me help him out. You're part of the sin. Don't help him in the sin. Because he's sinning and you are sinning also. And uh, usually online, I get this problem all the time. People are posting, how many people has a Facebook? Who else has a Facebook? Okay, make sure you guys connect with me, okay? Many people, you probably have realized, many people are posting many materials online of Islamic, which is not even correct, because they don't identify, they don't know that. And what happened? Because the shaitan will spray in their heart. They tell them, if you post it, you're going to get a reward. They don't get a reward. They get a sin. And there's something called uh, Sadaqah Jariya, and they're going to get a sin of Jariya. Because how many people read it, they get the sin who started that. And the fabrications and all these lies is being spreading out. Okay, praying Salah in a t-shirt. The minimum requirement of to pray a Salah is you have to be covered from the navel to the knee. Everybody knows that, Alhamdulillah. Everybody knows that. That's a minimum requirement. But many people say, okay, if you don't have covered this and you, you don't have a cap, you cannot pray. But that's a minimum requirement. But if you have a source that you can like wear more clothing, have to be like everything covered, that's more recommended. But if you are like uh, going on a street and uh, the prayer time is running out, it says in a, a Surat, a Surat an Nisa, verse number 103, that you have to pray on time because that's what is more is most uh, pleased to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get that? This is what is most pleased to Allah. So let's say if you're going on a street and you're wearing a t shirt. So are you going to go back to uh, wear a complete clothing and you make a salah or are you going to pray on time? What are you going to do? You're going to pray on time, right? That's a pray thing. Yeah. So this is the mini minimum requirement. But if you are at home, that's like a mostly like a recommended that you make sure you've been covered. You have to have a cap and you have to wear full clothing. It's not like you get up from your bed and you make a word to start praying. Got it? OK, anybody has a question? Yeah. Alcohol? Alcohol? Yeah, my mother told me that if you sell alcohol, the money you make, anything you buy with that money is haram. Is that true? Okay, I'm going to answer that. <clears throat> while back, I went to a convenience store, and uh, it was a Muslim store. And this is a very disappointment that many Muslims are being working in a convenience store, and um, everybody knows there what are, what are the things in a convenience store. But many Muslims do not take care of it. May Allah give them a hidayah. I went to the store and this brother was from uh, from some country and uh, he was like uh, giving alcohol to someone. I told him, brother, this is haram, don't do that. He said, this store belongs to my uncle. He said, this store belongs to my uncle. And he said that it is halal for you to, to, to sell it because the, all the merchandise and everything belongs to me. You don't get the same. So that's fine for you. You work for my convenience store. That's fine. So I answered him. So I, I told him this hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said like, uh, like handing over, carrying, selling, buying. If you fall in that category, that's haram. And the rizak that goes to your house, that's haram. It is similar to uh, playing lotto, selling lotto. So make sure how many brothers here, please, I'm telling you, if you go to convenience store, it is obligated to every Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, every Muslim is a da'i. You don't have to be a scholar to tell somebody you're doing wrong, brother. Please don't do it. I do that all the time. I go to convention and I say, brother, please, this is haram. Please don't do that. Because the reason you go take you home, that's haram. Even sometimes I see their family, they bring like a whole hijab and everything. But still, they don't care. because. Labeling yourself Muslim 
because labeling yourself Muslim. But living a life according to Muslim is a different. Because you just label yourself, you pray five times, you do fasting, you go to Hajj and everything, but you don't care about what... If you say this is, this is what is obligated by Allah, right? Same way Allah has obligated that these things are haram, don't do it. Still people doing, why? Because for the sake of money, for the sake of business, people are doing that. It is all our duty to stop people from doing this. When you go to convince or when you talk to somebody doing wrong, stop them. Brother, please don't do it. That's it, just a reminder. Okay. What else? Come on guys, you don't have any question? Okay, I'm gonna end up this program. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.